I'm Scott Crow of OSA Outreach and welcome to Roger Williams Park Zoo. Today we're filming a video just for you guys here in Rhode Island and all of New England on a species that you've asked us so much about. Welcome to Venomous Snakes of New England. Here we're in the Northern Copperhead exhibit and also Timber Rattlesnake exhibit. Now I love showing you guys these videos, but what's extremely important is to understand the conservation of these species, especially the endangered Timber Rattlesnake. And we're very lucky enough to have any sort of exhibit like this here in Roger Williams Park Zoo to understand that and the efforts that are going on for the conservation of such a species. I told you guys we had to bring out the big guns, so we're bringing in Executive Conservation Director Lou Parati to explain about all the efforts that are going on to save the snake species right here in New England and answer the questions that you guys might have. Let's go check them out. So what you guys look at, Lou Parati has brought out a northern copperhead, which is absolutely a fantastic species of snake. It's absolutely beautiful. Now the thing you notice is the color pattern on the snake. Um, this species right here is a camouflage snake because that's, it's a species of habitat. That's what it does. It's, a, it's for feeding. It's for defensive. Um, Lou's going to kind of get in and start talking about like the natural history of this snake in New England and Rhode Island as well. I've just safely tubed this uh, to, uh, northern copperhead. Um, and again, here at the zoo, we have very strict protocols about the way we handle these snakes. And again, the safest way are these clear acrylic tubes. Now this snake poses no danger to us. We can safely uh, take a look at this beauty. Um, this is the northern copperhead, um, native to New England. Um, no records for the state of Rhode Island. Um, these guys are uh, found in Connecticut, up through parts of Massachusetts and New York. Um, but nothing in Rhode Island. The, the, the habitat type here just doesn't cut it for these guys. And you know, these guys enjoy those uh, really rocky talus slopes at the base of really uh, uh, tall cliffs, um, which we, we lack here in Rhode Island. But um, you know, we get a lot of calls for eastern milk snakes being blamed to look like copperhead. And unfortunately, a lot of eastern milk snakes, which are non-venomous, lose their lives because of the fact that they, they resemble these guys. And they both have this type of coloration uh, to blend in. And as you see, it's very leaf colored. If you've, you know, look at leaf litter, these guys blend right in with the leaf litter. If you've ever seen one in the wild, you'd know um, these guys are really difficult to see. Um, that's one of their defense mechanisms is blending into their surroundings um, and vibrating their tail rapidly to kind of let you believe they might be a rattlesnake. Um, and they give off a very pungent odor too. If, if, uh, if you've ever walked near copperheads, you can usually smell them before you can see them. It's a very distinct smell. And like he was just talking about, uh, you, you, if you come up on you can hear the tail just rattling right there on the leaf litter. Because you got to remember, the venom, the bite is the last resort. Last they, resort. They don't want to use that venom. They want to use that strictly for hunting. They don't want to waste it. Venom can be, uh, can be controlled. I mean, if, if you are to be bitten, they can bite you with none of it or all of it or very little of it. They can control the amount of venom they use and they do that with their prey species too. They wouldn't use as much venom to kill, say, a weanling mouse as they would an adult mouse or a, or a chipmunk. You know, they'd have to hit that with a lot, much, you know, a lot more venom to, to make sure it doesn't go too far um, so they can find it. Um, usually it's bitten, um, they follow the scent trail and then swallow, of course, head first. Um, but again, this guy would rather not bite you. Um, they're usually pretty placid snakes. You see, she's uh, allowing us to hold her hair. She's not trying to bite the tube. Um, she, she's a, a great example of, of the northern copperhead. It's fantastic. It's an absolute beautiful animal. And that's the thing we really want to stress with you guys is, yet again, we don't really run into, we do not run into northern copperheads into Rhode Island because they're very habitat species. Um, they, like I said, Lou was right on that. They're like more of a mountainous, uh, very rocky land area. The other thing I want to get into is how he's just talking about discriminating killings. A lot of snakes lose their lives because they believe they're northern copperhead. And what you're looking for in Rhode Island is they're just not. And it doesn't mean you should be able to kill a snake because it is a venomous snake. These are an extremely important part of our ecosystem. And if you look at the northern copperhead, you know, they have that triangular head that everybody uh, associates with, with venomous snakes. And, and that's where the venom glands are, which gives it that wide appearance. They have an elliptical pupil. And then they have that very distinctive pit between the uh, eye and the nostril. Um, giving him the name pit vipers. And that's just the organ that they use that can detect fractions of a degree uh, in temperature change. Because these guys are ambush uh, hunters. They'll sit in a leaf litter or they'll sit by a log, a fallen log, which are basically rodent highways. 
um, and wait for a rodent to walk down the top of that log. And, and that fraction of a degree change is what triggers that strike. So fantastic. Um, the other thing is we want to get into is understanding what would you do if, if I ran up and I walked up into the snake species in the wild, what would you suggest? Just, you know, enjoy it from a, a distance. You know, you wouldn't poke a sleeping bear and, you know, you wouldn't grab a skunk by the tail. Um, so again, you know, you keep a, uh, you know, your distance from the snake and safe distance. I mean, no snakes attack humans. The snake's not going to jump off the ground. The snake's not going to come at you. If anything, if it has a means of escape, it's going to use it. It's going to slide. And they're usually not far from a deep rock crevice. So, and they know if you walk up on one and he feels as though he's been uh, spotted, he's gonna slip down that rock crevice and you're never gonna see him. Um, first defense is he's just gonna sit there and hope to God you're not seeing him. Um, so no, I, I would say, you know, encountering one of these snakes in the wild is a treat, it really is. I mean, even us uh, professionals, when we go out looking for these, unless they got radios in them, they're really hard to find. I mean, you gotta really look hard for these guys at you know, the, just the right conditions at the right time, or the chances are you're never gonna see one of these animals in the wild. So fantastic. And the other thing I just wanna get into, if by some strange rare chance you are bitten, how potent is that venom? Copperhead venom, there's, it's rare. I think there's only been one or two cases of death by copperhead, and that's, uh, you know, because of an allergic reaction. Um, you know, just like bee venom, you know, any venom, whether it's scorpion venom, bee venom, snake venom, it reacts to people differently. Um, copperhead venom is not as toxic as, as most venomous snakes. You know, a lot of their, their diet consists of amphibians, small rodents, uh, birds, you know, their diet even changes seasonally. Um, they'll eat more amphibians in the sp early spring when they're more prevalent and then switch over to nestling birds come late spring and summer and then they'll go to rodents in, in the fall when the birds have all fledged. And so it's really cool how they can uh, actually adapt their diet to what's available seasonally. Um, so their venom need not be that toxic uh, to knock down a frog or a small mouse. Whereas something like a timber rattlesnake that can get big and might be eating rabbits and something that's going to give a little bit more of a fight, you know, they'll have much more toxic venoms. What's the conservation on here at Northern Copperheads? Northern Copperheads are either threatened or endangered in, the New, in most New England states. Um, they're more common than the uh, timber rattlesnake. You know, they're not as iconic. They're a bit more, uh, you know, cryptic and secretive. So a lot of people don't enter their habitats. Um, but there are ongoing uh, studies looking at habitat use for these guys, population sizes. We are keeping our eyes on these guys uh, to make sure that this beautiful, iconic New England species stays in the landscape for future generations. Absolutely fantastic. I just want to thank Lou Prati, and we're going to go check out Timber Rattlesnakes. you have anything else you want to finish up on the Northern Copperhead? No, just, uh, you know, please, you know, when you're out there, um, if you do happen to see one or you think you might see one, please send us the information. Um, we, we'd love to, to hear uh, what your observations are. Um, but, you know, if you do uh, are in the habitat of the Northern Copperhead and, and uh, encounter one, enjoy it. Enjoy it and, uh, you know, let it be on its way to make more Copperhead.